Hi, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Today is the Day Changemakers, where we highlight the changemakers, the motivators, the inspirers, and the mentors that are helping so many in their corner of the world. And today, I am, as always, so excited to welcome another guest. Um, and our guest today is Jacob Slichter. I, I'm just so happy that we're having this opportunity to chat. Jake, thank you for your time and welcome. Thank you. It's really fun to be here. It's, it's great to have you here. And you have such an amazing bio. And I want to let you share information about yourself because you're doing, you've done so much with, in, in your lifetime. And I really would love for our listeners to hear all the, you're so dynamic. And I'd love to hear <laughs> for them to hear all the different dynamics that make up Jake. So, um, you know, um, right now I'm a teacher at Sarah Lawrence mm -hmm. and I teach uh, creative writing, which is really great work. I teach creative nonfiction, which allows students to sort of write about their own lives and kind of own their own stories. And I came to teach writing because I wrote a book um, in 2004 mm -hmm. and um, before writing, and the book was about my experience of being in a rock band. I was, I'm in a band from Minneapolis called Semisonic. And we had lots of, we had lots of adventures in the music business world. And um, so I wrote about those, wrote about that in my book. And um, someone I had met when Semisonic was sort of recording our first record was a novelist who years later was the director of the writing program at Sarah Lawrence. And he called me up on August and said, hey, we need somebody. And um, I remember meeting you and then I, I saw your book and um, uh, loved it and wanted to know if you could come here and teach. And I had actually fantasized for years about teaching. Um, weirdly, it's just like one of those uh, you know, you, the, 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 the writing teacher, I think, is sort of like a, 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 a long-standing alter ego of mine. Like, I wanted to <laughs> be that person. And so I was like, wow, that sounds really exciting. And in, in fact, it was. And um, so I've taught since 2013. Um, and it's just the most rewarding kind of experience. That's amazing. And, and so I, I'm, like I said, you know, professor, teacher, um, rock band, uh, the author, it's just yeah. incredible. And so I want to go back, of course, right? So go back a little bit of time. Obviously, I, it sounds like the rock band came first before the author and then the teaching. So when did you start with music? Let's just go start with that for a minute. Well, I started when I was a little kid. You know, I started in second grade. I picked up cello and piano. And, um, and then in fifth grade, I added the drums. I sort of stopped taking piano lessons very early on. It was like too many lessons, but you know, I sort of kept diddling along and playing with records and things. And then I picked up the drums in fifth grade and um, I talked to kid on my school bus into selling me his idle drum set for $25 in allowance savings. And, we had in our house, there was a room above the garage. So I set it up in that room and started playing along with records. And then I got into a band when I was in high school. And it was actually, a um, unlike most high school bands, it was, um, it included people who became future professional musicians. They were all older than me. Um, and I really learned a lot from them. And it was sort of from that moment on that I thought, well, I really want to be a, a, you know, a professional musician. Um, and I sort of, you know, I went to college, I bounced around the country, ended up in Minneapolis where uh, I knew some people. I grew up in, in Illinois, uh, but I ended up in Minneapolis and um, two friends of mine and I, um, started a band which became Semisonic. And, um, you know, I, I wrote a lot about this in my book. It was a, it was kind of an intense experience because by the time I got to this point in my life, I was in my early thirties. And I think most people think of like rock band is kind of something you do in your teens and your twenties. Um, so by the time we had a record deal, I was like in my mid thirties. 
and everybody who came to our shows was much younger. So I had a lot of imposter syndrome and a lot of stage fright and um, I had to get through all of that. Right, um, right. But I did and, um, and we had some hit songs um, and a lot of, you know, success. And then we kind of, our, the follow-up to our success kind of went like that. And it was at that point that we sort of went on break and, and that was the point at which I said, okay, you know, I've always, I've always written things uh, mm -hmm. other than mm -hmm. music and I'd like to maybe write a book about this. So uh, I did that. And I found that that was a really powerful way of like owning the story and coming to terms with all that had happened. And mm -hmm. And so two things happened. One is that I learned in the process of writing how much I already knew about writing because I had done music. Right, exactly. And then that helped me when I started teaching writing because I realized, you know, these students know a lot more about writing than they think they do. Um, and and what, what, how can I show that to them? So I tried to develop a curriculum that sort of put them in touch with the skills that they actually already have, but they just hadn't put names to. Um, and I, I saw how much writing a book had done for my sort of feelings about my rock career. And I wanted to give students an experience that sort of matched that, that so that they could think about, you know, students who are in college, you think, well, they're so young, but actually a huge number of them have already been through traumas and oh, yeah. a lot of emotional stuff. And, um, they need to be able to write about it and think about it and process it. Um, so there's a way in which being a nonfiction, nonfiction teacher is, you're not only teaching people how to write, you're teaching them how to think about their lives. And that's such a powerful part of the work for me. And I think it really um, was extra powerful for me because I'm married, but I don't have children. And so this was like, I used to joke with my mom, uh, you know, well, it's like, now I have the kids, but I did, I got to skip all of the diapers and the carpools <laughs> and all that stuff. And now I'm, you know, I'm here for this very important part of their life where they're like going from being like, they're right. sort of learning how to become an independent, like adult out in the world. So it's actually a really kind of spectacular time of their lives that I get to be there for. It's a stressful time too, but it's, it's it's a really wonderful experience for me. And yeah, they're coming into their own, you know, where they're trying yeah. to get that point and figuring out who they are or who they want to be. Yeah. And it's you know, there, there's every stage I feel like is difficult in its own way. You know, whether you're in middle school, high school, or you know, let's face it, you go through college, now you've done, you know, X amount of years of schooling, and then you're dumped out into the real world, right? And you're like, now what? I always yeah. go into something, right? Yeah something I had to do and now, now I have to figure it out. And so you get them right before that stage of now I have to figure it out. And you, you know, and what you were saying is helping them write nonfiction, helping them write about themselves. What a great way to help them get ready for that stage of that jumping off point, because they can, it's, it's, it's almost therapeutic, I would think for them to go through that. Yeah. It's therapeutic in as much as it's, you know, that you, so there's the cathartic part where you get the story out and that part is therapeutic. But I think what's also therapeutic is looking at something scary, which is writing about something that you maybe never talk about with other people and then pushing yourself into doing it. And I never, I never force my students to write about things that they want to write about. But I find that if you, if you give them encouragement, you'll find that actually they really do want to write about it. Mm -hmm. And what they want is a place that feels um, safe. They, they, they want to, they want a place that feels safe, but challenging. Mm -hmm. They want to push mm -hmm. themselves. I find that um, this is a big myth about today's students. When people talk mm -hmm. about safe spaces um, and they, and they sort of diss the idea of safe spaces, they think that kids want to be coddled. They don't. None of those, none of the students I have, want to be coddled they want to be encouraged they want to work um and i find that they, they take much more satisfaction in a course in which they've been pushed than one in which they mm -hmm. could just kind of like mail it in oh yeah absolutely and uh you know i've got one in college one graduated college as you know 
Um, so, which has been great because Gabriella, my daughter, has uh, has worked with you and been in your class. And um, yes, I, I agree with you. I think that there's a, a misnomer there that this this age range, that age range, just wants people to give them everything. There might be some. I mean, I'm not going to you know generalize that the whole population doesn't feel that way, but I think a lot more of them want. I know, you know, my daughter included wants to be challenged. Yeah. And. And wants to feel connected and 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 you know and is looking for connection and i think that that's it's great to have someone like yourself to be out there who is supporting that and pushing them along uh you know one of the things i want to i want to ask you too is, is as you were talking about your music is what did music give to you before the band i think it was um part of what it gives to you you can't put into words um first of all because it's music, uh, it's it's a physical kind of activity. Um, so it is ecstatic. It's an ecstatic experience. Um, I think what music does is it connects me to something bigger than me. Uh, mm -hmm. So um, one way to describe this, one of my favorite experiences as a in my career as a rock drummer was when my band was playing in Mexico City. And um, we were playing, and they do this thing in Mexico City with lighters. Um, you know, in the US, before cell phones, people used to hold lighters up, and yep. they'd light them and hold them up as a sort of we love you kind of gesture. Right. In Mexico City, they flick their lighters in time with the music. So as you're oh. playing the drums, the whole wow. arena would go, with the drum beat, pow. and it was just like mind blowing. And it was that was one of the moments that crystallized something that I had sort of been thinking about for a while, which the, which is that at a rock show, the show is really the crowd. The band is the excuse for the show to happen. Mm -hmm. The band is what sort of gathers everybody there, so there can be a show. But the show mm -hmm. is the crowd. If the show were the band, you could just show up and watch Soundcheck and think, oh, that was the most ex amazing thing I've ever seen. But of course, it's nothing like being there when there's a whole crowd because the crowd is the show. The crowd is the thing that's bigger than you. And, and, and the music is what brings us all there to sort of connect. So I think experiences like that, or maybe have you ever had the experience of you're in a car and you notice one car over, someone is singing along with the same song that you're hearing on the radio. Oh, yes. And suddenly you feel connected to that person. You, you feel connected to their joy uh, mm -hmm. or, their, or their sadness. Maybe it's a sad song or whatever that song is experiencing and whatever that person in the car next to you is sort of processing, you kind of feel it processing for you too. So I think that, that music for me has always been about connecting to something outside of myself that's bigger than me um, because I feel like there's something powerful there. Oh, absolutely. So, you know, one of the things we have is uh, we, uh, I'm a co-founder and CEO of the Zach G. Applauder Kids Foundation, and we provide funding to children who could never afford to take ongoing lessons in dance, acting, instrumental music, and vocal instruction. They could be funded for up to 11 years through us. Wow. And and so we have, you know, kids that are on the spectrum, we find them teachers, we have kids that, you know, just they need this outlet, they've lost a parent to suicide, they've lost a parent to overdose, and the music, and we had a, a child who, who found her father, um, who passed of an overdose, she found him at seven. And, oh, gosh. And she, we were funding dance lessons for her, and her mother was incarcerated. And we got a call from the grandmother two days after the father passed saying, please don't take my dance lessons away, it's all I have left. Oh, wow. Seven, and wow. when you talk about that connection and how it's bigger than you, we didn't know when we started the foundation. It's in my dad's name. We didn't know that the connection that it would have for the kids that are part of it. But your story totally resonates with. It's incredible what music does. It's a healer. It's it's a motivator. It's a connector. It's everything you just said. And I didn't know that. You know, I've played instruments in the past. I played cello and violin for a year each. So I'm, I could never pick that up again at seven and eight. Um, but I remember feeling like part of something, but to hear the kids that are involved and to hear you, you know, and that's what we tell the kids, 
you know, even if you don't do that for a living, when you get older, never give up that, that connection. If that's what makes you feel good, even if you're not going to be, you know, they all, you know, a lot of them want to be in the rock band or be on Broadway or make it to a stage. But even if you don't, don't give up that dream of can still connecting with the music because it's such a great healer. Yeah. Yeah, it is. I think, you know, um, music, the connection that music provides is, um, in some ways very concrete um if you're in the other if you're in the room with someone who's making music you their voice literally makes you vibrate i mean you you don't feel like you're vibrating like you would if you're like you know uh had a massage pad on you or something like that but it is actually doing that and if you're singing along with them then you're then you're sort of resonating with them this sounds very new agey but i actually think it's it's actually quite straightforward and concrete that the um the connection so for instance at a rock concert if everybody's singing along uh there's something very powerful about speaking or singing with everybody else at the same time in unison you feel you 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 feel them resonating in you, and you get the sense that you are resonating in them. So you you really do have this very concrete sense of being connected to other people, which is you know as as everybody knows that's a really that's a really powerful experience. Sometimes it's a, a super intense experience. Um, so it's powerful mm -hmm. medicine. And I feel like all judgment goes away at that point, right? Because if you're if you're sitting there banging your head and you're you're dancing and, and somebody else is dancing, you're not judging each other. You, even in that situation, you're in it together. So the, the judgment goes out the window. There's just this together and oneness, and 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 I love that. And yeah, it is so powerful. Uh, you know, you mentioned something before about a little bit about the imposter syndrome. You know, of of getting into the band, and I, I just wanted to explore that a little bit because. I think that a lot of people feel that way in different parts of their life you know, when they experience different things. Could you share a little bit more about what made you feel that way and how you got through that? Yeah, well, I think my imposter syndrome started really young in life. I, um, I grew up in an academic household. Both of my parents had PhDs. Um, my dad was a sort of world famous physicist. Right. Um, and his friends, you know, the people who would sort of roam the, the room at the various parties that my parents threw or that we would go to, you know, their friends parties, there would be Nobel Prize winners in the crowd. And, you know, and I've, it wasn't, it didn't take long for me, you know, by the end of grade school, I was like, not gonna make it there. You know, I'm, I'm not gonna be able to do that. A lot of pressure. Yeah, and well, it was pressure, but it was also um, there was a, a yardstick sort of suspended in my mind, mm. and I was really at the bottom end of that yardstick. And my, you know, just not n nobody told me that. Just sort of like based on how I understood people, sort of taking stock of the world around them. Mm. Um, so. And then, of course, you know, so I, I grew up around a lot of like physicists and mathematicians and scientists and um, and I had this, I sort of inherited this idea that music is not as serious as math or physics. And of course, within music, drums is like the least serious of all. It's kind of like, you know, um, it's got this low reputation. Oh. Um, so I think for years, I kind of struggled with that. I think, you know, my dad actually was one of the people who really insisted that I not think that way. Mm -hmm. um, but I had a lot of programming to sort of work my way out of. And so even to this day, you know, I sometimes am wondering, well, how good am I at this? Or how good am I at that? Am I a good drummer? Am I a good writer? Am I a good teacher? And um, I realized that I'm, I was asking a lot of questions. So this is getting to the, how did I get out of imposter syndrome? Mm -hmm. um, I realized that I was asking myself a lot of questions that can't be answered. You can't answer the question, is so-and-so a good pianist or not? 
or a good drummer or not. Um, we don't, it, it's not a question like, can Jake bench press 400 pounds? No. Can he run a four second 40 yard dash? No. Um, but I, there are other questions like, did I write today? Yes. Did I practice drums today? Yes. And I learned, you know, start asking yourself questions that you can answer. Um, and, and just plant your feet there. So, and that gets me out of sort of like, what do other people think? Because what other people think is all over the place. Some people will think one thing, other people will think another thing. You'll never be, you'll never get the answer you, you want because there is no answer. It's an unanswerable question. Am I a good drummer? The only answerable question is, did I practice drums today? Um, Am I able to play this exercise as well as I want to? Um, did I write today? Does my writing speak for me? Um, you know, very concrete questions is what sort of took me out of the crazy space of how good am I? That's incredible. I have to tell you, that's an incredible message to share here because I think one of the reasons I really started this podcast and um, the YouTube channel is the fact that we all, you know, we worry about judgment. It's part of the part of why I wanted to do this. I wanted people to share where, you know, their growth process and learn from each other. And I feel like you've just shared such an important message that so many people, whether you're a leader or you want to be a leader or you're a professor or in a rock band, it doesn't matter. Those questions you can ask yourself every day. Are they factual? Are they concrete? Yeah. If, if it's an opinion, it's such a great, it's a, if it's an opinion, it's not a real question. That's yeah. like, wow, what a great way to put that. Thank you for sharing that. that. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I think one other place I think this is important in my life is like my values. Like, am I a good person is, is not a question I can answer. But did I show up today for things that I believe in? Yes, mm -hmm. no. That is a question I can answer. Um, Am I a good parent? You know, a lot of people have that question. Well, that you, you, no one can answer that, but did I show up for my kids today? Did I, you know, did I do the things I wanted to do? So like, there's all kinds of places in the world where we can torture ourselves about how good or not good we are, but we're really not addressing the more important questions, which is like, what did we do today? Right, right, and those, those Fabulous way to look at it and a, and a great new way to look at it for those like myself, who I do the game, you know, the game of, did I do that right? Did I say that right? Did I stutter in that space? Should I go back yeah. and do it and retape 10 times, you know, yeah. and, and you get to a point where you're like, you know, I just, it's got, you just got to let it go and you yeah. just let it be. And um, good, like you said, there's a yardstick for everything. And where do we fall? We don't really know. But if we're doing our best every single day and giving it our all, that's all we can do in the, in the end, in the long run. Yeah. That's amazing. I, I Also, we didn't mention the title of your book. So I want you to share the title of your book and where can people find your book? That would be great. <laughs> uh, here, I'll get a copy of it. Just a second. Oh, that's awesome. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. It's called, So You Want to Be a Rock and Roll Star. Um, you know, you can get it at bookstores. Um, it's definitely in uh, online, uh, all the online places. It's available as an ebook. I always encourage people to buy it from their local bricks and mortar bookstore because we need to support those businesses. Mm -hmm. And um, they're how I find out about so many cool books that I have come to love. So. That's a great message. And I totally agree with you on that. And um, how long did it take you to write the book? I'm just curious. Boys, it's so quickly, uh, like in retrospect, uh, it took me a year and a half. I can't believe I did it so quickly. Um, I had been writing road diaries all along during the band, right. you know, so I had some earlier material, but um, yeah, it took me about a year and a half. And um, I would say that as I sort of had alluded to earlier, while I was writing, I was like, boy, this is a lot like in music where you, you know, when I'd be mulling over a writing problem, I, I, I'd realize, oh, this is a lot like in music. Like, don't, don't make the intro too long, you know? Um, and 
at a certain point I thought like this book needs a bridge, you know, just like a song sometimes needs a bridge. And so I put a bridge into the book, you know? So, um, the, I, and I was like amazed all the way through at sort of like, um, all of the lessons I had already learned about writing, I had learned as a drummer in a band. Wow. So. Yeah. I, I think sometimes we don't connect the dots internally and it's, it's so great when you can do that. Yeah, I love connecting dots. I, lo I love reading about how to do other things because it often reminds me, oh, I've actually already learned that lesson, but in, in writing, we call it this, or in drumming, we call it that, you know. Yeah, and I, I like how you used a bridge in your book. Yeah. <laughs> So I have to admit, I haven't read the book yet, but I am totally definitely going to grab it. And I hope others will do the same. I, I have actually, by chance, I interviewed someone earlier and they told me they saw you on a podcast and that your story was incredible. So you're, you know, I just, and they've, oh, read, wow. and they've read your book. And I was like, how funny is that? Like I, I had mentioned, I was going to talk to you today. So I was like, how funny is that? So I'm just so, I'm so glad to hear, um, you know, all of the success that you're having. Semisonic, what's going on now? Uh, we have a new album, uh, our new EP out called You're Not Alone, which is weird. You know, we the songs were written like two years ago, and yet now they're sort of, they almost feel like they were written for this moment where we're all like separated mm. from each other. Um, and um, that came out in June. No, what am I? The song came out in June. The record came out in uh, September. And then um, we'll... We'll probably be making a um, another EP or another EP or maybe we'll just like throw it all together and call it an album. I'm not sure, uh, but sometime you know in 2021, right? Um, we're got our fingers crossed that we'll be post pandemic at some point before too terribly long, and then we can start playing the shows that we had planned on playing last summer. Wow. Where were your shows mostly going to be? Um, I would assume sort of like, well, we're from, as a band, we're from Minneapolis, though only one of us lives there now. The guitar player lives in LA and I live in New York. Oh, wow. Um, so you're really all over the map. We're tri-coastal. We're like <laughs> east, east, west, and north coast. Um, <laughs> and um, so, but I would assume we'll play Minneapolis, New York, LA, Chicago, and maybe a few other um, cities around the country. And then an outside chance that we'll play in the UK where we always had a, a pretty good following. Um, okay. So we'll see, you know, I, I think um, we'll just sort of see what makes sense. I you know, we're living in a, nonsensical world right now with the way all this going on. Yeah, we sure are. Um, you know, the teaching part, how to be tough this year, the performing part. If you're an author and you want to write 10 books, this is a great opportunity, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, I myself have started a book about six years ago and it's still working its way. It's not there yet. So when I hear a year and a half, I just love hearing those stories because that's amazing. Yeah. When you feel it and it can come out, you can admit, and you can make it happen. That's amazing. So, out of the three things that that are so wonderful that you do, which one makes you feel the most? Do you feel the most connected to the most? Would you say? And I'm, I know you're connected to all three: the 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 being a professor, being an author, being a musician. They work differently. Um... You know, so like um, teaching probably has the most immediate sense of uh, doing something for me because um, the people with whom I'm working with, uh, you know, our, our collaboration is just ever before me. And so I see what's happening as I see them growing and changing. Um, and in fact, it's always a mutual kind of growth, like we grow together. I'm always learning something as a teacher because each each set of students brings in different of course. challenges and opportunities. And um, so you're always sort of, I'm always sort of tweaking how I do it because I each set of students sort of requires new, uh, me to think about things anew. Um, 
writing is the place where I can just sort of be most purely myself because the, it's sort of like a, a quiet space all to my own. And then, um, you know, drumming and music, I think the interesting thing about that is it's, it's the most obviously physical. Mm -hmm. um, so there, I, I'm glad I, all of which is to say, I'm glad I have all three because um, I wouldn't want to give up any of those. You know. They all provide a very unique outlet, right? Yeah, they do. Um, and they all speak to each other. They, um, you know, I think that they, they feel, um, on the outside, it makes sense to think of them as like three different things. On the inside, I feel like it's all sort of one project that I'm continuously trying to sort of wind together into one cable, you know. Or, or maybe, maybe as I used to think of it, like when I got out of college, I was like, well, I like doing this, but I like this, and I'm interested in that, but I'm also interested in that. What, what should I do? And then I, I don't know why, but I immediately saw the bottom of a mixing bowl with like eggs, sugar, flour, milk. And I thought, oh yeah, you just kind of keep doing all of it and it kind of comes together and makes a batter. You yes. know? So that's kind of what has happened with me. Like um, things I've learned about writing have inter informed my teaching and things I learned about teaching have actually informed like my conversations with my bandmates about the making of our most recent record and the making of music, of course, always flows back into the writing and the teaching. So it all does really feel to me like one project. And if I could say it's about anything, I would say it's about learning. So um, um, it's about learning and about how people learn. Uh, so um, I think like uh, I've, I've maybe sort of, it would take an hour, it would take hours to sort of unpack exactly <laughs> what I mean by that, but, but I will just put that label on it at least. Yeah, that, and it makes sense, and I like the way you you know you brought it down to the yeah. mixing ball, right? Yeah. yeah, that's it. There's so many ingredients that make us who we are. Yeah, we, you know, we're not just one symmetrical. We, yeah. we have so much going on within our minds, and um, I myself, you know, CEO of a not for profit, running a podcast, and I'm a consultant. And it's like you know, you want to. I love all of those things, and there's so many people now. I think now more than ever, people are wearing many many hats. Um, because they want to do something they absolutely love. And they're trying to figure out, in some cases, how to make money doing that while they have to do something that they know how to do really well and they enjoy, but it pays the bills too. So it's nice that, you know, people are now, I think more so than ever that I've seen, people have maybe more than just one or two interests that they're dabbling in. And they're allowing that to happen, which is awesome. Right. Which is great. So question that I ask every one of my guests. If I knew then what I know now, what would that be? I think um, the 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 question about um, learning to focus on um, well, I guess one of the keys to my life right now is that I try to to show up at least a little bit every day for the things that are important. And um, so I make sure, and rather than setting extreme, extravagant, impressive sounding goals, I try to meet small goals, but do them every day. So, um, and usually I exceed them. So like write for 15 minutes, but maybe I'll write for two hours, I don't know. But if I write for 15 minutes, that's enough. And drum for 15 minutes. And almost every day I drum for like 90 minutes. But if I do 15 minutes, that's enough. I can stop and go for a walk. And, you know, my, my daily goal, I, I really try to hit 10,000 steps, but you know, if today's a terrible day and I'm just like not feeling it, it's okay. The important thing is to make the gesture and to make it on a regular basis. So that has been a real game changer for me. And that's great. And that's a great message because sometimes we set these extravagant goals and then they're unreachable and unrealistic. And then we feel terrible about ourselves instead of saying, wait, did I get, did I move one step closer? Whether it's a big step or a large step, who cares? Yeah, exactly what you just said. It becomes a negative feedback loop because the shame of not doing it, I think most writer's block is mm -hmm. definitely the shame of not writing. Right. 
And so like tr saying to yourself, okay, it's enough if I show up for 15 minutes. That was hard. I'm just going to put an X in a box and I'm done. And if you do that five days in a row, something starts to happen. And if you do that, if you take two days off and then you do it another five days, after a while you build into a rhythm and things start to loosen up. And because I think that's um, what I tell my students is we think of writing as like, boy, I've got to just like face the music and like push myself out there and really just sit down and write it. And they're making a fist as they do this. And I think, mm -hmm. well, yeah, but what you, you don't fight your way into writing. You relax your way into writing. It's when you are relaxed, when you're able to access your creativity and your insights and all of that. So the, the thing about showing up for 15 minutes is about learning how to relax into it. The first few days are really tight. But after a while, you're like, no, 15 minutes, I can do 15 minutes, you know, and you, you show up and you relax. And the more you show up and relax, the more you find you want to keep going. You know, it's funny. I think, you know, we're, we're, we're looking at a new year here and a lot of people put resolutions out there, right? And yeah. it's the first one, I'm going to lose weight. I'm going to exercise every single day. And they, you know, and if I don't go to the gym, then forget it. I, I, I you know, I, yeah myself justice and, and I've already failed, but you can get on the floor and do a couple of crunches and still be at the gym for yourself. And so it's just perspective and being oh, able to look at it and, and be creative if you can't, you know, and like you said, if you don't do 15 minutes today, it's, you know, the world won't end if you do 11 minutes, um, <laughs> right. you know, you can always do, you know, 19 minutes tomorrow, you know, so, it, right. you know, it has to ebb and flow. So, so Jake, is there another book in, in the uh, mist for you, you think? Yeah, I've, I've just, I finished a book that I'm hoping will sneak out into the world sometime this year. It's a, it's a memoir about my um, experiences with religion. Wow. Okay. So very different than what we've yeah. been talking about. That's yeah. interesting. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Is there any kind of sneak peek you want to, you want to tell us about real quick? Well, I guess the sneak peek would be, it's actually not that unrelated to what we've been talking wow, about. Wow. That's so, I love it. Okay. That's great. I love yeah. it. All right. That sounds good. So you're not sure yet when it's going to be released, but I will make sure that uh, we put that out there. when yeah, it I will definitely let you know. Yeah, that's great. Congratulations. That's awesome. Second book coming out. Yeah. He's, you know, a, a rock star musician who is um, doing great things, a professor, an author. I have, I've been so blessed to have this conversation with you. So thank you so much for sharing your message today. Thank you for all your work and for all these podcasts. Oh, no, I'm excited. I'm excited to be a part of it. And I get, I'm so thankful and blessed to have people like yourself who trust me with the interview process. So thank you for that. Absolutely. And I just want to remind everybody what I always close with is today is the day. You cannot go back to yesterday and you do not yet own tomorrow. So remember to take whatever that step is, small or large, to get you closer to whatever those goals are. Have a great day and we look forward to seeing you next week. <laughs>